First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. You might wonder why someone from a national library is, is talking to you about uh, what is really big data and, and data analytics. Um, and I would, in my defense, I would cite two things. One is that I, since 2008, uh, the British Library, where I work, we were the first organization uh, in, I believe, Europe to ask for an exception in copyright law to the monopolies that copyright creates for the purposes of analyzing data and information. Uh, that resulted in 2014 in uh, a copyright exception which allows for non-commercial research purposes um, people to, to analyze uh, text and data and, and in, indeed any form of content. And then for the last two years, I've worked as a um, Horizon 2020 European Commission funded project called Future TDM. And what we did was we, were, we, we looked at uh, the various different barriers that exist to further uptake of data analytics technology in Europe, um, which I will talk about through, 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 through this presentation. So um, I would encourage anyone to visit this website and uh, we have all the outputs and, and some guidelines, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit, a bit later. So um, I'm sure many of you will have heard this uh, perhaps overworn adage that data is the new oil. But really what we're talking about here, although this is entitled text and data mining, you know, a large part of the big data economy is down to data analytics. So I will use these two terms rather interchangeably. So um, as we know, we have a data deluge. Uh, we, if all the data that we had in electronic form was put onto DVDs, it would, it would reach from here to the moon and something like three quarters of the way back again. Lots, lots of information. Um, other, other information around the data deluge uh, that is estimated something like 50 million journal articles have been published since 1665, not all of them by Elsevier. Um, and uh, that the global scientific output doubles every nine years. So, you know, there's a lot of information out there. And there are a lot of companies out there who are making economic. Uh, benefit and creating social benefit also, of course, from analyzing data. So this is a slide you will, of course, have heard of organizations, some of these organizations, some of them that you won't are um, British-based startups and SMEs who are predominantly mining the web and creating uh, economic value. So what is um, what is text and data mining? What is data analytics? Essentially, what it is is a process whereby you, um, and you don't have to do it using computers. It, it, you know, human beings have been analyzing information for millennia. Um, but, but when, so we mustn't forget that actually this has been going on for a long time, but, but what we're talking about now is usually computers, and what computers are doing are they are structuring information, they are, algorithms are being written to extract the information that they've been programmed to extract. So essentially you have information and then you have the algorithms which extract the information for analysis purposes. And again, you might have further sort of smaller chunks as you get more and more derived data. And you know, questions are being asked um, of, of, of the information. So it is, it's, it's reading quickly, it's thinking, it's, it's analyzing and using computers to do this. So clearly, you know, we'll, Big data is discussed a lot, but it's also fundamental to artificial intelligence and, and AI. What it isn't is, you know, it isn't search. It is really analysis, and algorithms are being used specifically to analyze uh, text, film, sound, pure data, anything. So now I'm just going to give some examples. This is, this is a really uh, interesting manual project where where uh, people were um, employed to go through the very large collection of 
doctorate theses that sit in the British Library, and they painstakingly went through them and extracted all the molecules mentioned in these theses. And, and these have ended up in the Royal Society of Chemistry's chemical database. And ex extraordinarily, 50% of molecules extracted from these theses were not known about. They do not exist in existing molecule databases. So again, lots of, lots of new information there. Um, another example, um, so this is paper-based, I believe, so uh, by analyzing many articles, Swanson was able to see a link between fish oil and Raynaud's syndrome, um, and a, a more recent uh, scientific study um, has been looking at the benefits of um, curcumin, which is a molecule found in turmeric in the ginger family, and, and thalidomide, the th you know, the, the thalidomide of 1960s notoriety, and, and, and the kind of positive benefits um, that you can see from literature about other subjects and for this discovery that actually these, the, these, this medicine, these molecules help in the treatment of Crohn's disease. Twitter, I mean, the internet is the source of data that, uh, that is used most for data mining purposes. You know, Twitter, one of Twitter's business models is, is to sell all the tweets. And this is uh, an example of analysis of different dialects of, of Spanish. Um, this is a slide from a colleague of mine at the National Centre of Text and Data Mining at the University of Manchester. Um, and he said, oh, people will like this because it's got a robot in it. So that, that picture is a, is a robot. Um, and what they have been doing is they've, again, been analyzing 35,000 different uh, events um, uh, around breast cancer. And what they've done is they've focused on the molecules to try and look at the interaction between molecules and genetic mutations which cause, cause breast cancer. So what they've been able to do via text and data mining is go through all these articles and come up with a, a 150 compounds which are essentially new or not really known about in terms of the interaction with, with breast cancer. And currently, um, Eve, that, that rather large robot scientist on the right there is, is, is kind of looking at the interaction between uh, these compounds and breast cancer. And of course, you know, when we use Amazon, Amazon is analyzing the way that we, we use the website and making recommendations. I, I don't know about in Germany, but we all have sort of loyalty cards in our supermarkets. You know, the supermarkets are analyzing how we, we, we purchase to sell us other information. So this is going on all around us. Um, here's some example from the University of Stockholm where, again, they're working with uh, people in the pharmaceutical industry to improve decision-making and discovery of, of and treating kind of side effects from drugs. They're also working with Scania to, to uh, try and make the, the, the running of heavy truck fleets more efficient. And this is sort of one of the first foundings that, that future TDM uh, kind of, I, I'll mention here is that it's quite interesting that despite in 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 industry uh, and and the economic field, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of discussion of the value of data. We found that at universities, there's no really. We found very very few examples of where universities were strategically thinking about this new research tool. Um, and, and we found a few mainly in, in, in the low countries. Um, but generally, it seems that if you're a researcher and you're interested in these tools, people are relying on their own personal networks. Because at that strategic level in the university, this is not being thought about. No presentation on big data or text and data mine mining would, would, would be worth its, its, its salt if it, we didn't have big numbers. You know, these are the kind of numbers that, that we're talking about in, in terms of, of value um, to, to the European economy. You know, 29.4 billion US dollars in 2021, 
a third of that uh, being down to data analytics and text and data mining. Um, my colleagues um, uh, in, in the project The Economist estimated that because of this technology, the European Union's economy will grow by 1.9%, um, which, which will equate to two, 206 billion worth of, of euros. So, you know, this is, this is important stuff economically. And what we did as a project, uh, you know, what we were doing as part of, 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 of the Horizon 2020 project was looking at what the barriers were to try and address how we might uh, improve things. And I think this is very interesting. This came from one workshop, and the numbers are slightly different in subsequent workshops that we undertook. But generally, we were seeing um, legal factors basically being copyright law as the main barrier that people were perceiving, and the second being skills and education, so lack of skills. Um, not enough data scientists, not the right kind of culture in, in private industry that you might have the data scientists, but if the culture wasn't right in, 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 in the company, um, the, the, they, even, you, even though you have the data scientists, they can't effectively work on, on big data to realize value for the company. I mean, interestingly, one of the technical factors was the lack of big data available in the public domain. And what came up again and again and again was Wikipedia being the main source of big data that data scientists were free to work on. So when people, data scientists arrive in companies, they actually are not very skilled because they've only had small data set, sets to work on. So yeah, lo lo and lo lots of interesting findings. So you might wonder what, what any of this has, has got to do with copyright law. You know, we're, we're, all we're doing is analyzing information to make a, a hypothesis, find a result. And the answer is, in the paper world, this has nothing to do with copyright at all, that you are absolutely free to use a pen and paper look at books, look at articles, read websites, et cetera, et cetera, um, read manuscripts, synthesize all that information, and ask a question, come up with a result. So in, in the paper world, um, copyright is not relevant. But it is relevant in the way that, particularly in Europe, we think about copyright law, because what copyright law does is it creates a monopoly um, which prevents any form of copying while something is still in copyright. And what is going on here, as I explained earlier on, there is copying um, going on because you're having to make copies of data, normalize it, synthesize it, work on it. So even, even if at the end of that, the answer of all that data analytics is, yes, there is a correlation here, or no, there isn't a correlation. Um, because upstream you are copying, um, then copyright becomes uh, an issue. I mean, we even have a law all over Europe uh, which makes caching on your computer legal. I mean, we are that precise in terms of copyright law that, that we regulate and allow um, a, a cache on a computer. So uh, not the case in, in other countries like the United States and some uh, Asian jurisdictions. So I think one of, the, one of the questions is, why is this such an issue in Europe, as I've just outlined? It, it, partly it's an issue in Europe because of the way that we think about copyright law, that any copy, however transformative, however non-substitutable with the original copyright work, um, is it is still regulated by, by, by copyright. You know, as I said, just to get the answer yes or no, or 80% probability, copyright law is, is, is being enacted because your co computers are making copyright upstream. So as I said earlier on, um, 
the, the UK started thinking about this probably seriously in 2010. And it, 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 I think it became rather obvious that the UK government, who was interested in, in supporting, uh, I think, primarily startups and SMEs, um, but were, were, were sort of going to introduce this copyright exception. So the scientific publishers, I think, saw that the writing was on the wall and went off to Brussels to said something terrible, not Brexit, is happening in the UK, um, and we need to stop it. So what, what, what happened was in 2013, uh, four commissioners convened something uh, called Licenses for Europe, where there was stakeholder engagement, and one of those streams was on text and data mining. And um, in those discussions, um, under the banner of Licenses for Europe, uh, a number of people from uh, the scientific community, the publishing community, the newspapers, uh, researchers, businesses, librarians were, 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 were asked to come up with a solution, which under the title Licenses for Europe, essentially had to be a license. And um, essentially, after a number of meetings, the researchers, librarians, SMEs said that we would no longer participate in, in the meetings because we felt that we wanted to discuss other solutions um, to, to facilitating text and data mining. And we also asked if we were talking about the internet, and the commission never answered that question. And given that that is the main uh, data set that is, that is mined, it, 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 it really felt that the Commission didn't know at that point enough about what we were actually talking about for it to be a meaningful dialogue. And, I th and because of, essentially, the walkout, um, the Commissioners did begin to realize that this was an important issue, started to link the dots with, with, with big data, and that was very much thanks to a number of colleagues in Research and Innovation, DG, and the then Commissioner Gagan Quinn was very vociferous to the likes of Michelle Barnier to say, you know, this is an important area and we need to tread very, very carefully here. That, um, under the current uh, European Commission and Parliament, resulted in a proposal um, from the Copyright Unit as part of what's called the Digital Single Market Directive, which is essentially, a, I would say, a sort of an extension to the existing Copyright Directive. The proposal put forward in September 2016, I think, was from the Commission was, to put it politely, very poor. Um, it entirely ignores the fact that most organizations do this are businesses. Businesses are excluded. Um, and even uh, libraries who are not affiliated with an educational establishment in that draft are excluded. You know, my library, the National Library, is, is the law has huge holdings, and yet we would not be able to benefit from, from this proposal, which is just bonkers. Um, on the positives, um, one of the things that librarians like to grumble about is that copyright exceptions that we get in, in, in law um, can be overridden by contract law. So the proposal explicitly says, which I think is very good, that the, um, the contracts cannot stop a beneficiary from text and data mining. And it also waters down the ability of rights holders to apply technical protection measures, i.e. technical DRMs, protection measures, which stop you doing the data analytics. Um, you know, again, w taking a step back, it's important that you, people realize that the law is, of course, neutral. We're talking about material that is in copyright. And as I've said a number of times, you know, the main data set that is mined by anyone is the internet. Um, so no, but we, we're, I'm not aware of anyone lobbying saying, no, shouldn't use the internet. But what we are seeing 
is, is, is lobbying particularly heavy against this proposal from the scientific and technical medical publishers. I mean, in the library community, if, if, I, if I said to you, what, what is Elsevier, most people would say they're a journal publisher. But I, on Google last night, I, I, I put in Elsevier, and this is what came up. It was incredible. Elsevier is a global information analytics business that helps institutions and professionals progress science, advance healthcare, and improve performance. They're not a publisher. They're a global information analytics business, which might explain um, why they are opposing this legislation. Um, because, you know, again, if you're doing analytics, you're purchasing access to their, their articles. You have the right to use that material. If the answer is yes or no, or 80% probability of, of this enzyme causing this disease, you know, that's not substitutable for the journal in any shape or form. Um, so, kind of, you know, why this opposition? And I think it's very interesting, and Elsevier isn't the only one. If you look at the acquisitions that Elsevier, for example, have made, they, through ass assignments from copy, from, from academic authors, they own the copyright in, in the articles or the books. They've bought Mendeley, which uh, offers um, collaborative software. The researchers use, so if you look at the privacy notice there, there's the URL, they're mining all the information, you know, what are the researchers talking about, what are they doing, what websites are they visiting. So they're able to do analytics on what the researchers are doing. And then they recently, uh, this year, they bought B Press, which is a hosting institution of content. So I think if you think about science, um, they have the copyright monopoly in, in the articles. They have uh, the ability through Mendeley to analyze researchers' activities on the Elsevier platforms, of course, they're monitoring what, what researchers are doing. And then B-Press, they have and will be able to analyze behaviors around content. So in terms of science, I think that's the whole scientific digital work stream that they have a stake in. And I think that, that explains partly why the scientific publishers have so strongly opposed this. So at the end, where are we now in, in, in the process? Um, we have the proposal from the commission. Um, it's been, we have opinions for an, from a number of the committees in the European Parliament. Um, some are very favorable. Yes, businesses should not be excluded. Um, yes, of course, all libraries should be beneficiaries. Um, and let's make the technical prevention barriers lower. Um, the crucial one, uh, the Legal Affairs Committee still has to put its report forward. There's been an unfortunate change in, in the lead of that committee on this issue from a Maltese MEP who was very um, open to libraries, including all sorts of libraries, and understanding that this is about big data, not just science and libraries. Um, and early indications are that the current lead, uh, who's a German MEP um, from Bonn, is, is sort of less favorable. But, you know, it's kind of early days, so we don't really know where we're going to end up. Um, I think we are, and, and, and the member states are again discussing this. Again, indications are that the member states do not really understand that this is about big data and business value. It's become very much a discussion around libraries and scientific publishers there. So we won't know where we end up. Um, and I predict that at the earliest, we will probably have a directive uh, next summer. But I suspect it will be even later than that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, we still have a chance for, for some questions. Uh, I think it is a very complicated topic, so there might be one or the other 
who uh, has questions. At least I have one. <laughs> so what about you? No questions. Oh, yeah, OK. Well, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Elsevier at the end. Um, as they actually trying to uh, provide their database to open source, uh, they reached out for um, different um, uh, databases which are available to open source like Wikidata and are trying to organize something uh, to make their database uh, available as CC0. Uh, so th this might surprise you, but uh, it's going to be interesting that Elsewhere is trying to actually to uh, break uh, their policy um, with uh, providing those data as a proprietary value, and now they're going to uh, provide this uh, as uh, open source. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's just one example. Um, again, interesting, if you look at Wiley's uh, acquisition profile, again, you see them in investing in... Uh, data analytics companies. Uh, a lot of the historical secondary publishers, people like Gale and Sengage, Sage, on the historical side, are, are, are very happy for people to use the data that you subscribe to purchase in any way. So, you know, and as I said, we, we are not hearing anyone from whoever it is that represents the internet to say, no, you should license access for data analytics purposes purposes of the internet so it's you know it's it's not a homogenous field at all but I was giving I wanted to give a uh, a sort of a flavor of where opposition to 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 this new European wide exception is coming from okay one more Oh, we, we've we've yeah. broken the first question barrier. Yeah. <laughs> Great. My name is Rudolf Sauer. I was a personal scientific assistant of Professor Nölle Neumann in the Institute for Public Opinion Polls in uh, Allensbach, Bodensee. And I just want to mention the breakdown of the Soviet Union was caused, uh, partly caused, because uh, the results in uh, armament technology, they were very uh, uh, secret. And it was not possible to transfer these results to the normal uh, business, uh, to the normal industry, providing things for everyday use. So that shows that too much uh, secrecy is uh, harmful. One more. Axel Ahmed, Institute for Museum Research, Berlin. Uh, you've been talking rightly about a lot uh, about libraries. Does this copyright problem also affect museums, archives, other institutions of that kind? Or does this problem mainly stem from the fact that we are talking about published, um, published documents that go th uh, through a publication chain or a publisher's chain? We're, we're talking about any form of information that's covered by copyright. So we're talking about manuscripts, web pages, films, sound recordings, anything. Um, I mean, one of the main projects where the British Library has been data mining is actually sound recordings. So, you know, any, any information can be analyzed. And if it's in copyright, that's kind of the, the issue here. One more, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, I'm, I'm John Weizmann from Wikimedia Germany, and happy to have you here at the conference. Uh, I was wondering, you skipped very quickly this slide you had that said the right to read is the right to mine. Um, and, and you touched a little on the fact that in the offline world, you don't need to ask for permission in the first place to read something and draw your conclusions from that. So there's the argument that um, this harmonized exception we have in Europe for transitory copying of content for purposes like relaying it through the internet. That this also applies to what is happening, what the, the copying that is happening in, in TDM um, processes. 
So do you think that this is a, still a valid argument, or is the right to read, is the right to mine completely dead in the, in the discussion? Or would it maybe even be um, a, an option to, to add to this directive um, a clause that says, in countries where this is not a, a use in the first place, you don't need this exception? Because when you introduce it, an exception, you're saying vice versa, that this is a use in the first place. Um, oh, lot, lots of bits there. The reason I skipped over it was um, it, it, in the Licenses for Europe forum, um, I mean, it's sort of, in a sense, cheap policy um, activity where we would repeat the right to read is the right to mine. And you know you're getting somewhere where the commission or the, uh, those that are opposing repeat back to you the right to read is the right to mine. So we were quite successful in kind of getting it into people's psyche. Um, I think, I mean, you mentioned two things that m there are instances, uh, I think, not many, where you could use this temporary, um, temporary copy sort of um, uh, caching exception is what I call it. The, uh, but mainly, you know, people in, are investing a lot of time and money to do the data analytics, so the copy that they keep is not temporary. Um, and I don't think we'll get a lobbying slogan into the directive. <laughs> okay, one more question, and then I want to have the last one. Yeah, Philip Zimmer from the Federal Ministry of Research and Education. Um, my question is, how do you see the connection between your national efforts in copyright law for a TDMA exception and the European, uh, on the European level? Do you think it will interfere with your national um, exception? Yeah, um, that's, oh God, is that a Brexit question or is that a... <laughs> um, we, I was really surprised, so the UK government is of the opinion that we will have to implement the European exception, um, and that will replace the UK exception, so we can no longer keep the UK one. Um, which, yeah, I, 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 I've, yeah, so that's that's the view that we will have to replace. Okay, one last question. Um, you mentioned very shortly that in, in the States, for example, uh, the um, TDM is covered by fair use doctrine. Mm. Um, what do you expect as the future of uh, uh, cooperations between Europe, uh, European and American institutions when you have such a divide of law or legal uh, framework? And um, do you think that the Americans will do the work for us because they are allowed to? Or do you think that there will be a, a good future even for cooperation? And another Brexit question, <laughs> what, is the, what is the consequence um, uh, for the UK? Are you sticking to the European way? Or do you think that there is a chance that you Follow, let's say, let, 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 let's, let's call it the American way of uh, fair use and a wider okay. uh, legal framework. So not a TDM is. question, more like a yeah. cop, just a general. Um, so on, on the, sorry, the uh, repeat the first one. I was, the first question was? Uh, what, what does it mean for European and oh, American yeah. corporations? So what, what it means at the moment is, um, so we had an interesting case at the University of Amsterdam where uh, text miners were using newspaper comments. So they weren't actually using the newspaper articles, but the comments that people write. And they were analyzing the comments as a way of predictive analytics to predict what sort of stories that newspapers run are popular. And the uh, lawyers from the newspaper company came to visit the University of Amsterdam. And the University of Amsterdam said, okay, 
hands up, we are, uh, we are breaking copyright law, um, we will send, we will continue because we're part of an international consortia and our colleagues in America will do the work that we were doing. So, you know, that's a, that's a real example. And I think, you know, there is a danger there in, in extra European collaboration that, you know, it's just easier to do this kind of stuff in fair use countries like America, South Korea, Singapore, Israel. And some of the SMEs, um, startups that I know, you know, they're very international and they say, well, at the moment, you know, what we're doing is we know is isn't isn't legal, but um, uh, if we get big enough to sue, we'll probably go to the one I know well. Well, is she's actually Hong Kong Chinese? I'll go to China or I'll go to America. So I think you know that is a real mm. thing that we heard again and again and again um, as part of future TDM. And then in terms of um, UK copyright law. Um, I think, um, I personally think that Brexit seems to be getting more and more unpopular every day. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, as people who don't think about these things are starting to see, ooh, inflation, ooh, costs are going up. So who knows? But, you know, if we do leave single market, the Customs Union, the European Union, and sit by ourselves on a very sad island in the North Sea, um, it's going to be a tradable. You know, we will trade copyright for something else. Because the, I've been on the panel, actually, in, in the Houses of Parliament where we talked about Brexit. Not one person put their hand up saying that they wanted divergence from European copyright law. So I think, you know, it will be traded. But even if, you know, in, in Boris Johnson's wet dream where the UK has a trade agreement with <laughs> South Korea, um, you know, South Korea has a trade agreement with the EU. Part of that trade agreement requires that South Korea complies with European norms on copyright law. They can't diverge from that, so the UK-South Korean trade agreement will not be able to diverge from European copyright law, which makes me think at the professional level as well as the personal level that this hasn't really been thought through. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you.